Well, let's just open with a word of prayer, shall we? Our gracious Lord and loving Father in heaven, Lord, I just pray this morning that as we look into who you are and the names that you have revealed yourself to be to us so that we could personally know you, Lord, I just pray that, Father, we would get a renewed sense of love, of adoration, of respect for who you are, Lord, and for who you are to us and in us. Thank you, Lord. So we just give this time over to you, Holy Spirit. Have your way. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You know, in the book of Romans, in the first chapter, the 20th verse, it says that since the creation of the world, God's power and his divine nature have been clearly seen in what he has made. And that was so true this past, well, last fall when Pastor Tom and I drove out to Wyoming. We were on our way to see Yellowstone and the Grand Tetons out there. Really a dream of ours that we had had for many years. And um, I was really, really struck by the vastness as we drove mile after mile after mile after mile. This is what we saw through that. It's a plain state. And so you know, we just keep driving, keep driving. This is what we're seeing. Keep driving. I can see it on the screen up here. And, you know, as we just drove and drove and we were listening to praise music and just enjoying God's, God's beautiful creation, I was struck at the vastness of that state because we had to go from the eastern portion up to the west, northwestern portion to get to Yellowstone. And so... Um, You know, this is what it looked like. And you can go ahead and flip through these slides. I'll just say something as you put them up. Um, I think only once as we were traveling that long, long stretch, we saw a buffalo. Now, when we got to Yellowstone, we saw a lot of buffalo, which was very, very exciting. And so it was just this flat, flat, flat. And then all of a sudden, we would start coming into like these rolling hills, but still just like nothingness out there. You didn't see a house. You didn't see herds. Nothing. It's just, you know, goes on and on and on. The vastness, the vastness. Go ahead. You can... Oh, this was um, the Badlands. We went to the Badlands. And look at that terrain. And that just went on for as long as you could look out over the horizon and see. That was the terrain. That There was different colors of it and everything. Beautiful. Um, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> And then as we kept driving up towards Yellowstone, um, it began to get a little greener with these beautiful uh, pine forests and stuff. But still, look at it. It's just still vast. And that's what struck me. And I got to thinking to myself, okay, go ahead. Oh, then we got into where it was mountainous and these big rocks and stuff. And... um, and these beautiful waterfalls and these deep crevices and stuff, you know, just the majesty of his creation. Oh, yes, there's one in every crowd. (laughs) My husband. Yep, the one that always makes me laugh. Um, But anyway, so then we were heading towards the Grand Tetons, just majestic mountains of rock that God created. And so, um, you know, in, in just seeing and driving for all those hours, it became very, very real to me of thinking about how big God must be. I mean, I don't know if he's big. Jesus is our size, could be he became a human being, but I don't know how big the creator, the father is. I don't know. I don't know. And then it made me start thinking even about space, you know, and all the wonders that you see in the heavens. And there is a, um, NASA has a Hubble Space Telescope. And this telescope, um, let me put my little specs on here, my little readers. (laughs) So this telescope has been able to see that there are numerous solar systems out there. And it orbits from about 340 miles above the Earth. And just to give you a little, like a frame of reference on that, commercial airliners fly about 38,000 maybe, you know, around there. And this thing's 340 miles up. (laughs) 
but it also sends back these pictures. And I wanted to show you this one picture, just talking about the vastness of our God. They sent back this picture of what they called the pillars of creation. Now, this is a massive, and I mean massive, um, uh, struck, I can't even say structure because it's cosmic um, dust and gases and stuff, but this is in a region where they are literally seeing that this is creating new stars. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? It's literally creating new stars. And you know what? This, this um, Hubble telescope was able to see this seven, let me look, 7,000 light years from the Earth. 7,000 light years from the Earth. It's able to see that far out. And it's also able to see that the tallest pillar is four light years tall. Four light years. Now, does anybody know what a light year is? I had to look it up. Here it is. A light, a light year equals six trillion miles. So if you take the four and you multiply that by the six trillion miles, 24 trillion, that's with 12 zeros, okay? 24 trillion miles high, that, that largest pillar is in that. Is God vast or what? Is God like awesomely, wow? <laughs> yes, he is. He's our creator. Now, it's about 25,000 miles, a little less, around the Earth's circumference. And it's about 240,000 miles to get to the moon. That's thousands of miles, OK? We're talking trillions here. That's how big that thing is. Way bigger than the Earth. <laughs> well, Psalm 104.2 tells us that the Lord stretches out the heavens like a curtain. And you know, in Psalm 8, there's a little song that we used to sing with the kids in Sunday school. But it's about Psalm 8, where it says, um, when I think about the heavens, the moon, and all the stars, what is man that you even think about him? And yet he does think about us. The scriptures tell us he thinks about us a lot. Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18 say, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is their sum. If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. That's a lot of thoughts. He must think about us every moment. When you think about all the sand in the seashore around the world. But seeing the vastness of his creation and being in awe and wonder of this awesome creator God, that still does not allow us to know him personally. You know, when we think of a man like, say, Elon Musk with his SpaceX program, he's a genius and with the Tesla car and all that. You know, we know about him, but we don't really know the man, do we? No, no. So how could this infinite God, this massively vast creator, how could a mere human being ever get to know him? You know, it's like asking a father to impart his innermost thoughts and feelings to his infant child. That's kind of what it's like. So God set out revealing things about his personality and his character, his attributes to us, the many facets of his being with various names that he revealed in the Bible. We're going to start looking at some of those names. Now, just as a beautiful diamond is one diamond, but it has all these beautiful facets to it, so our God, being our God, one God, right, has all these different facets to him. And just as a, a, a um, jeweler looks through one of those loops to look in, you know, and really see with clarity inside the diamond, we're going to take a look through the lens of the Hebrew meanings of his names that he revealed in the scriptures today. So I'm going to start with the name God or Elohim. In Genesis, the first name that he reveals to us shows us that he is one when all is lost in darkness and confusion. He brings back first his light and his life, 
and then his image into man and makes all things new and very good. In Hebrew, Elohim is a plural noun. And this is where we get the idea of the Trinity. And even though Trinity is not written in the Bible, and theologians, you know, they argue over it, but it does refer to the Godhead in the Bible. And the Godhead is a covenantal love relationship within God himself, because God is love. And this name reveals that God has certain relationships within himself, and because he is God, they can never be broken or dissolved. And you know what? In creation, let's look at that. He reveals himself as Elohim. And here it is, that who was, who was it that was brooding over the face of the deep? In Genesis, it says the spirit of God was brooding over the face of the deep. And then he had to speak. And who is the word of God? Jesus, right? So Jesus speaks, let there be, and it was. And then we see the Father say, let us make man in our own image and likeness, right? So right there you get the picture of the Godhead without saying Trinity. You know, you get this picture. That's what Elohim means. So, you know, in the scriptures we've already said Jesus is the word of God. All things were created by him and for him. <clears throat> That tells us that Elohim is in covenant with his beloved son and must be in covenant with all that he created and which only consists and is held together in him. John 1.13 tells us that all things were made by him and without him nothing was made that has been made. Colossians 1.17, Jesus was before all things and in him all things are held together. Wow. Jesus is the one holding all these worlds together, holding us all together, not letting us fly off into a million pieces, right? He's holding us together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Elohim is a covenant God who carries on his new creation work according to his purpose until all is very good. Mm -hmm. I want you to think of these names as personal to you yourself in your life and in your sphere of influence, in your world. He keeps working until all is new and very good. Pastor Dave, he was saying that this morning. The second one that we're going to look at is Lord or Jehovah. And this name reveals that God is true being. He does not change like shifting shadows, the Bible says. He's just and he's holy. He loves righteousness and he hates sin. And because evil is antagonistic to his nature... Because evil is not truth, it must be opposed and judged. All falsehood is sin. Jesus said that the devil's been lying from the beginning. So all falsehood is sin, and falsehood creates hurt in people's lives, doesn't it? God does not want that. So, but to think that he's mean and angry just because he will, he, you know, he opposes sin. To think that he's mean and angry at sinners is just not true because Je Jehovah is the God who suffers with his people. Mm -hmm. Now, sin was judged at the cross, mm -hmm. but who paid the price? God himself paid the price. We went free just by our faith in what he did for us. We went free. So he suffered on our behalf and with us. We see throughout the scripture how God suffered by the sin of his people. He was grieved with the idolatry that went on in Israel. Remember, um, you know, when, when they didn't listen to him. Did I lose my place? <laughs> yeah, he was grieved at the idolatry of Israel, because we know that time and time again, what did they do? They ran after strange gods. Even when they were led out of Egypt, what did they do in the wilderness? They made the golden calf and started worshiping a false god right in his presence when he was releasing them. And the Holy Spirit 
is grieved when we don't listen to him. The Holy Spirit wants to live out the life and character of God through us. And when we don't allow him to do it, he's grieved. So he suffers in that way. The son of God, what did he do when he went, finally went to Jerusalem and he looked out over Jerusalem? The Bible says that he wept because he said, how many times I would have gathered you together to myself, but you would not. And so we see that he suffers with his creation. And in his holiness, sin must be judged. But the righteousness of God is not complete if it only judges and condemns. The devil does that. People do that to each other, but not our God. Jehovah's righteousness does not rest until it also makes the sinner righteous. That's what he's at work doing in each of our lives. And we see that he suffers with us as he works to make us holy. Slide eight. El Shaddai. So God Almighty is the name that he revealed El Shaddai. And El denotes power and might. And Shaddai means breasted in the sense of pouring forth bountiful grace upon us. It's the picture of a restless child that nothing else will calm except its mother's breast. You know, and when we go through trials and things in our life, we can run here, we can run there, we can go all over the place looking for comfort in different things. But really and truly, we are not at peace. We are not fully comforted unless we run to our Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. Psalm 91 says this, that he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings or close to his breast, you will find refuge. El Shaddai, the mighty pourer forth, bountifully pours himself out for his children with self-sacrificing love, even to the point of pouring forth his blood so that we could be saved and he generously pours forth his Holy Spirit upon us, giving us abundant power to make us fruitful in every good work. That's right. He is a good father. Hallelujah. And we worship you, Lord. But El Shaddai does not mean that he can just do anything and everything. The almightiness of God is this. It's the power to carry out his divine nature to the uttermost for his plan and his purpose to go forward. It's that power that keeps it moving forward. Just like Pastor Dave said, you know, there's highs and lows, but he, he, he uses like this. He goes, yeah, highs and lows, highs and lows, highs and lows, highs and lows, but what are we doing? Amen, amen. And that is what El Shaddai, our mighty God does. He's able to subdue all things to himself, Philippians 3.21 says. And you know what? He does this work through us, the church. That's who he's chosen in this world to work through. We are the ones who, when we become like Jesus, then that light shines to the rest of the world, and that's how people are drawn to him. And he continues to do it, which is why, you know, Pastor Dave says, we don't have to look at the world with, with doom and gloom glasses on. Because as we do our part and let our light shine and, you know, let um, what's in us uh, be poured out to other people, more and more people will come to the light. And then what glory it will be, then Jesus will come back, Right? He's coming back for us as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. So he's able to subdue all things unto himself, and he'll pour himself forth until we are fruitful partakers of his life and nature, until all things are put under his feet through us. The next name that he shares with us is Most High God, or El Elyon. El Elyon is the God over all creation and all realms, even the unsaved. Sometimes I think in the church we forget that he is the God over the unsaved too. He created them. Every person that's ever lived on this planet was created in the image and the likeness of God 
for his plans and his purposes, to bless them, to bring them into his family, to fill the earth, right? To be fruitful, to fill the earth, because he wants us as a family. He wants, he's such a, he has has so much love that he just wants to share that love with all of humanity. Hallelujah. Now, all of the people, as I said, are sons of God. But this El Elyon name means that he will deal with wickedness and sin. The Most High, El Elyon, will, if need be, overthrow, overturn, and overcome his people until he again has his due place in them for their own good and blessing. That's what he'll do. So, hallelujah. I mean, isn't that what Jesus was doing when he went in and he, he took the whips and he turned over the, the tables at the, of the money changers? Why did he do it? He did it because his house was to be called a house of prayer. It was to be a place where people could go in and meet with God. And here were these people in the very presence of the place where people came to meet God, cheating and stealing money and doing, you know, the sin and wickedness. And so he showed them, "Uh uh-uh, no, this is my place, (laughs) right? This is my place, and I'll have my due in this place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And it also makes me think about, you know, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, you know, they had cried out to God for 400 years in bondage, right? We know that Pharaoh is a type of Satan and Egypt is a type of sin. And there they were, slaves to the bondage of Pharaoh, right? Like we once were slaves to sin, right? Under a cruel taskmaster, the enemy, right? Until we found freedom in Christ. So there they were in the wilderness. God is leading them. He's even sending manna from heaven, heavenly food down for them. And here they are grumbling and complaining and saying, oh, I wish we could go back to Egypt. At least we had leeks and onions there. No complaining. No complaining. No. We're to be a grateful, thankful people to God for everything that he does for us because he supplies everything. Hallelujah. And so what did he do? He said, okay, okay. All right, you don't want my provision. You want meat. All right, I'm going to send you quail. But you're not going to eat quail just for a couple of days. You're going to eat quail all month until the smell of it comes out of your nostrils. (laughs) He'll have his due place back again, won't he? (laughs) Praise the Lord. You know what? I'm thankful because I don't know where I'd be in my life if he didn't keep bringing me back on the straight and narrow path. <clears throat> Hallelujah, I'm thankful for that. You know, he'll let us go as far as we want to, <clears throat> stray as far as we want to stray, enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, and it's just for a season, and then the pain comes. But he'll let us do it. He'll let us. He won't stop us. We have free will, right? He won't stop us. But how much better it is to just give him his rightful place of lordship and avoid all the pain, right? right. Amen. Hebrews 12, 11 says that no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And that gives me great hope for those that we love and we're praying for that still are not fully surrendered and submitted to the Lord. Because this God, he'll let them go far enough, and then, you know, he'll be, they'll be out from under the shadow of the wings of, the, of El Shaddai, right? Where the enemy can fire those arrows at them, right? And they, they know nothing about the armor of God. So they're just out there getting hit by the devil until they get tired of it. And then they cry out to God, right? Hallelujah. And especially as we're praying for them. That's so important. So do you see how so far what we've seen of God, that these names, even though they're different faceted, they kind of all, you know, you can't see one without really seeing some of all, you know? 
So we're going to move on now to names that might touch each one of us a little more directly, being called into that deep relationship where we begin to know the mind of God and to have such a close and abiding relationship with him. The name Lord, or Adonai, means Lord or Master. It's the relationship of a master to his slave and as a husband to his wife. And we might bristle at thinking that we're a slave to our master. But, you know, in all reality, we don't own anything anyway. It's all God's. Mm -hmm. Everything that we have has been a blessing and given to us by him. And he's the one that meets every need that we have, every single need that we have. So, you know, what do we have any need for? It's okay that he's our master because he's a good master. And he blesses his people and makes sure that all of our needs are supplied. Hallelujah. We call him Lord. So when we do say, oh, Lord, or we pray or, or cry out to him or pray, you know, in the name of the Lord, that's what we're saying. We're praying master, right? That's what we're really saying. And we call him Lord to express our dependence on him, the one who made us and knows us so intricately that he knows us inside and out and knows exactly how to sustain each one of us individually with all our, our differences, all of our personalities, all of our different skin colors, you know, all of our different body shapes, whether we're male or female, right? He made us to live exactly where we live in exactly the time that we're living in with the exact body shape that we have, with the exact color of, that we have, with the exact color of our eyes, our hair, everything, everything, for his purposes, Amen. for his purposes to be fulfilled. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? Amen. Aren't you glad that God is so diverse? And, you know, his creation is just, you know, I only, I only talked about the earth and the... Um, and, the, and, you know, the, the solar systems, the heavens and that, but there's so many other worlds, like in the ocean and, you know, the animal kingdom and all those different things, all the diversity of our God. Hallelujah. Loves, loves, loves each one of them and each one of us so dearly. Well, what's a shame is that the world doesn't have a relationship with their maker. They don't know him at all. They don't call him Lord. They say whatever they want to say. They do whatever they want to do. You know, that they, their will is whatever they want to be, not even realizing that there's a will higher than their own. And what's sad is, you know, they don't enter into the type of peace that Pastor Dave was talking about, you know, the kind of joy in that that, that we have when we're surrendered to our Lord. Now, another one, um, Adonai, when we talk about Adonai, it's not just master and slave, but it's also husband to his wife. And that's an even closer relationship that we have with him. It tells us that the Lord of all calls us to the closest and most endearing communion with himself, that we're no longer one alone, but we're joined to him as one spirit. And just as a wife is not her own, but she's her husband's, so we are not our own. We've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. We're not our own anymore. And just as a husband shares all of his deep thoughts and feelings and maybe secrets with his wife, Adonai shares with us the mysteries of the kingdom, according to Matthew 13, 11. And Amos 3, 7 tells us that the Lord does nothing unless he first reveals his secret things, secret counsels, to his prophets. Psalm 25, 14 says that the secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. And 1 Corinthians 2, 9, we all know this one. I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for us, for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit. And as a bride of Christ, we're the bride of Christ. It says in 1 Corinthians 14 that when we pray in tongues, 
that we are speaking out mysteries that only God himself understands. So we have that close personal relationship with him. And because he first loved us and freely gave himself for us, now we give ourselves to him forever, freely, in total surrender, total abandon. That's where we want to be with him, totally trusting because he's so good to us and he loves us so much. And he's called us into this personal, close, close relationship. Now, this is, this is an important part of who Adonai is to us. That just as a husband and a wife in that union produce children, when we're in union with Adonai, then we are able to also produce that fruit, right? in the lives of other people. So that is how God uses his relationship with us, why he's called us into that relationship, right, that closeness, so that our life gets birthed into other people and the kingdom expands. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says that through us he diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Did you know that you are a sweet smell to some people? And the Bible says to others, you're the smell of death. But now he diffuses his sweet savor, his sweet fragrance through us as we're walking with him, walking in the spirit, loving and blessing people. Um, Pastor Charity wanted to share some things about my trip to Israel years ago with her kids. So that made me get out my, my pictures and stuff and start looking through things again. And um, I found this little diary that I had kept. It was my first missions trip. It was to Romania and then to um, the Arabs and the Druze and Bedouins and um, some of the Jews in Israel. And the pastor that was over that trip, I remember him saying this, and it's, it struck me back then, He said that he had quit um, trying to convert people years ago. You know, sometimes we think, oh, we got to be witnessing. Oh, when I'm at the store, oh, I've got to look for somebody to go up to and cold contact them about Jesus, right? (laughs) But he said he quit trying to convert people years ago. And then he just started being like Jesus and blessing people. And so his light was shining. He was blessing people. He was loving people. And he said, you know what? Whole community started coming to the Lord in Israel just through that. That's where his ministry was. Hallelujah. And so there we go, church. We don't have to work up anything. We just have to be like Jesus. Just love people. Offer them, you know, prayer if, they, if they're having a hard time. You know, let them know that, you know. When you give a cup of cold water in his name, let them know it's, in, it's for him. It's, you know, because of Jesus. And he'll get the honor and the glory for it. <laughs> well, the next name that we're going to look at is Everlasting God or El Olam. And the name Olam simply means time. It's interesting that where this name appears in scripture, it involves an age or a time frame. And a lot of times, you know, our Bibles will translate a span of time as everlasting. And I think that that's where the church gets the idea that every time it says everlasting, it means forever and ever and ever. And it might just mean an age or a dispensational dispensation lifetime. But everlasting God, or El Olam, is the God of time, and he's the God of the ages. The name denotes a secret or something hidden in the sense that he reveals things to us for our encouragement. But, you know, if you've had something that the Lord has shown you and you haven't seen it for a while, he's the God of time. In time, when you need to know what it means or a dream or whatever, (laughs) he'll reveal it at just the right time. God is never, ever late. Sometimes I say, Lord, I wish you'd be early on this, but he's never late. So what do we do? We do like Pastor Dave said this morning, and we just throw away the time, right? And we just depend on him because he's working everything behind the scenes, stuff that we don't even know. The God of time is working it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 1 Peter 
um, one says this, that the prophets, pro prophets prophesied of the grace to come and searched what manner of time this would happen, and even the angels desired to look upon these things. But you know what? What they were given back in the Old Testament was not for their time. Some of it was, but not all of it. A lot of what they prophesied was for our time. They were under the age and the dispensation of the law. And some of what they prophesied was for the dispensation of the kingdom of God, right? And we're living in that day in the kingdom of God. So he works through ages and dispensations. Now, let me ask you a question. In our age, what is it that we search the scriptures to know that we don't know that's a secret? What do we search for? How about like, when is Jesus coming back? We all want to know that. <laughs> so in our dispensation, that's what we look forward to, right? We search to try to figure out. You know, he says that we'll know the times and the seasons, but nobody knows the exact day or hour. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Except him. And so you know what? He knows what he's doing. So we take comfort and we marvel at the omnipresence of our everlasting God, El Olam, who is present in every age and knows the end from the beginning and steadily works his plan of redemption throughout every age until all is very good. And the last name that we're going to cover this morning is Lord of Hosts or Jehovah Sabaoth. Now, the Lord of Hosts is God over all the hosts of heaven. His angels are very active over nations and, and, and us as his people. And this name is most seen in the prophetical books. So we didn't see Lord Sabaoth like through Genesis, Exodus, those. But in some of the prophetical books, we see it when the prophet most keenly felt the failure of Israel, even having entered the promised land. And it's not until Israel becomes divided and is in peril of being led captive out, when all looks like loss, that's who the, the prophets turn to. That's the name that the prophets turn to, Lord Sabaoth for comfort and for deliverance and help. Now, what struck me about this was Israel, having entered into their promised land, still they failed. Still they went into sin. Still they faced things that looked like loss. So I'm asking you today, what are the things that we've faced? You know, we can be in the Lord for years and years and still face things and go through circumstances where it looks like all is loss, where, where we failed, right? Just like Israel did. And yet, there is a name that we can call on when it looks like all is loss, when it looks like it's going to be the end of something. There's a name that we can call on for help. Because even though they failed... And even though we have failed, God ever remains, and he's faithful. He's the Lord of hosts. He's Lord Sabaoth, and he's there to help, especially when people have nowhere else to turn. But like ancient Israel, even though our nation is divided, even though we have failed, what we learn from the prophets is that there is a name when all looks like loss that we can cry out to. His name is Lord Sabaoth, the host of our, uh, heaven's armies. And we don't want to ever, ever forget that he is the one that dispatches his armies for the correction and the deliverance of his people. And sometimes for the punishment of his enemies. The zeal of the Lord of hosts does this. So let's always remember as I close that the angel of the Lord encamps around about those who fear him, and he delivers us. Amen. That his heavenly hosts are ministering spirits sent to minister to the heirs of salvation. Yes. That's our Lord Sabaoth. Mm -hmm. And that his angels have charge over us to keep us and to protect us in all of our ways. 
you know, some of you have heard me testify many times of, you know, in an instant when I really, really was in a dire strait, like ready to crash on ice or something like that as I was driving the school bus. And just in that instant, crying out, God, Jesus, help me. And then just like that, he's there and, and it's a miracle. Amen. You know, how can a bus be going up over an embankment, getting ready to flip, and you cry out, and the next minute it's sitting perfectly straight on the road, and nobody in the bus knows how it happened. Lord Sabaoth is his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you know, uh, Brother Fred sitting back here, he heard me um, tell those testimonies one time, and, and he told me later on that when his wife, um, Ruth Ann, had a spell where she was having a lot of difficulty breathing, and he was taking her to Lancaster Hospital. And they had a ways to go yet, and it was nighttime. And um, while he was on the way taking her, her throat had closed up, or so, some way she quit breathing. She couldn't breathe. And he said that the Lord brought that back to his remembrance, and he just cried out, Jesus, help her! And as soon as he cried that out, cried to the Lord like that, she was able to start breathing again. So he wants us to know today, it doesn't matter if anything looks like loss in our country, in our private lives, in the lives of our families and friends, it doesn't matter. We have one that we can cry out to, and he sends his angels. In fact, they're on assignment right now. And probably there's many, many things that we're never even going to know about until we get to heaven and we know how the Lord protected us. You know, some things he allows us to see, like those miraculous things, and I'm sure that many of you have testimonies too. But some things we're just not going to know. But Lord Sabbath is always at work. So we thank him that he never stops working on our behalf that he's the God of the ages, that he works his plan, that he's very personal and shares his secrets with us, that he works through us to produce his life in others and never stops working through the ages until all is very good. Hallelujah.